on World News Tonight. Foreign Interference The United Nations appeal to both sides of the Sudanese conflict to cease fighting for Eid. Trouble in the East Foreign ministers of Seoul and Beijing clash due to comments on the non-interference. Success in Failure Despite exploding post-launch, Elon Musk says the Starship test launch was a success for future research. Wildflower West A winter storm deluge fools diverse California wildflower blooms all over the Western American coast. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're watching World News Tonight. We're starting off from Sudan. The World Health Organization says that at least 330 people have died and nearly 3,200 have been injured from the fighting in the country since last weekend. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has also called for an immediate ceasefire in the region to allow civilians trapped in conflict zones to escape and seek food, water and other supplies. The UN Secretary General appealed to Sudan's warring factions to observe a three-day ceasefire over the Muslim Eid al-Fitr holiday on Thursday. The fighting must stop immediately. I am deeply concerned about the terrible toll on civilians, the appalling humanitarian situation, and the horrifying prospects of further escalation. It comes as rival forces battled for a sixth day. Sudan Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan also received separate calls from the United States, Saudi and Qatari foreign ministers, and Turkey's president, according to a statement. Gunfire could be heard in Khartoum, where the fiercest battles are being fought, as thousands of civilians try to flee. The violent power struggle has killed hundreds so far, and is tipping a nation reliant on food aid into what the United Nations calls a humanitarian catastrophe. The United States said it was sending more troops to the region in the event that it decided to evacuate its embassy in Khartoum. White House spokesperson John Kirby said President Joe Biden was following the situation closely. He authorized the military to move forward with pre-positioning forces um, and, and to develop options in case, and I want to stress right now, in case there's a need for an evacuation. The violence that erupted last weekend was triggered by a disagreement over an internationally backed plan to form a new civilian government. Both the RSF and Sudan's military accused the other of thwarting the transition. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said that the United States and China can and need to find a way to live together in spite of their strained relations, which have worsened in the recent months. Addressing America's strained ties with China, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen Thursday laid out the Biden administration's principal objectives for what she called an essential economic relationship between the world's two largest economies. This is China strikes a more confrontational posture toward the United States and its allies. In a speech at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, Yellen said a growing China was in the interest of both countries as long as it followed global rules. A growing China that plays by international rules is good for the United States and the world. Both countries can benefit from healthy competition in the economic sphere. But healthy economic competition, where both sides benefit, is only sustainable if this competition is fair. We will continue to partner with our allies to respond to China's unfair economic practices. Yellen made her remarks amid heightened tensions and pessimism in the U.S.-China relationship over national security issues, including Taiwan and Russia's war in Ukraine. She took aim at China's No Limits partnership with Russia, calling it a worrisome indication that China is not serious about ending the war. It is essential that China and other countries do not provide Russia with material support or assistance with sanctions evasion. We will continue to make the position of the United States extremely clear to Beijing and companies in its jurisdiction. The consequences of any violations would be severe. Yellen said she intended to travel to Beijing at the appropriate time to meet with her new Chinese counterparts, but Treasury offered no details on the timing of a trip. 
South Korea's foreign ministry summoned the Chinese ambassador to South Korea and strongly protested a comment from Beijing, said that South Korea should not meddle in Chinese affairs. South Korea's foreign ministry says it summoned the Chinese ambassador on Thursday to strongly protest Beijing's criticism of South Korean President Yoon song yeols remarks on Taiwan. That's according to First Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs Chang Woo-jin speaking to reporters on the same day. Chang said that China's foreign ministry was guilty of serious diplomatic discourtesy by denouncing Yoon and calling on South Korea to refrain from meddling in Taiwan issues. This move comes as President Yoon, in an interview with Reuters on Wednesday, said tensions in Taiwan occurred due to forceful attempts to change the status quo and voiced opposition to such change. Yoon also stressed that the issue is a global matter that goes beyond China and Taiwan, like the issue of North Korea. Regarding the comment, Beijing's foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin on Thursday said that, quote, the resolution is a matter for Chinese who do not need to be told what should or should not be done, emphasizing that South Korea should not meddle in the matter. Hours after Beijing's comments, South Korea's foreign ministry hit back, saying the comments by the Chinese foreign ministry were unspeakable. Seoul's foreign ministry's Chang Woo-jin said that China should work to prevent unnecessary disturbance in the bilateral relationship between the two countries over the matter. U.S. President Joe Biden may announce his re-election campaign as soon as possible. Two people familiar to the matter said, settling that the stage for the possibility rematch with his Republican predecessor Donald Trump. U.S. President Joe Biden may announce his re-election campaign by video as soon as next Tuesday, according to sources on Thursday, setting the stage for a possible rematch with his Republican predecessor Donald Trump. Although a source cautioned that the exact timing of Biden's campaign announcement could change. Biden, now 80 years old, is the oldest person to have occupied the White House. If he secures another four-year term, he'd be 86 by the end of it. In recent weeks, Biden has laid out the likely themes of a re-election bid in political speeches and secured a doctor's note that says he is fit for duty. He plans to campaign on his recent track record, presiding over the economic recovery after COVID-19 and record job growth, although a 40-year high in inflation has marred his tenure. Democrats are split on whether he should run for office again in 2024. A separate poll released on Sunday found just 39% of Americans approve of his job performance. The White House and the Democratic National Committee declined to comment. Biden is expected to meet next week with top fundraisers from his last campaign, a key sign to showing whether his strongest supporters can overcome doubts about his age and prospects in another grueling race. Republicans have not picked their candidate for the presidential election yet, but polls show Trump leading over a pack of declared and undeclared GOP candidates, including Ron DeSantis, Mike Pence and Nikki Haley. A Tunisian investigative judge ordered the imprisonment of Rashid Ghanouchi, the leader of main opposition party Anada, and a prominent critic of President Kai Said. Following the closure of his Anada party's offices, a judge ordered the detention of Rashid Ghanouchi pending trial. The leader of Tunisia's main opposition Islamist party was arrested on Monday after mentioning a risk of civil war if opposition voices are suppressed. He's been charged with plotting against state security, one of some 20 political opponents and activists arrested since February. The judiciary must fulfill its duty during this time so that it meets the expectations of Tunisians and of history. We do not want to harm anyone, but we will not allow the country to become prey in the opposition's hands for them to mess with as they please. Opponents have dubbed President Kais Said's actions a coup and a return to autocratic rule. In a statement, Anada condemned what he described as an unjust ruling which aims to cover up the total failure of the authorities to solve economic and social problems. The Anada party held the most seats in Tunisia's parliament before President Said dissolved the chamber in July 2021, allowing him to rule by decree. The EU has expressed its concern while the US has condemned the arrests. Comments Tunis described as unacceptable interference. Going into a short commercial break, more world news on the other side.
Welcome back. A first test flight to SpaceX's next generation Starship spacecraft exploded minutes after liftoff from South Texas, cutting short a key step in Elon Musk's development of a rocket vessel to eventually take humans to the moon and Mars. What was meant to be the first test of the most powerful space launch system ever built ended Thursday in an explosion just minutes after takeoff. The uncrewed test of SpaceX's two-stage rocket ship, standing taller than the Statue of Liberty and the largest ever assembled, combined for the first time the private space firm's super-heavy booster rocket with its Starship vehicle. The two parts were supposed to separate, with the Starship planned to execute a 90-minute debut flight into space. As of right now, we are awaiting stage separation where Starship should separate from the super heavy booster. But less than four minutes into flight, a live webcast showed the upper stage Starship failed to separate as designed from the lower stage super heavy, and the combined vehicle was seen flipping end over end. We should have had separation by now. Obviously, this is, uh, does not appear to be a nominal situation. Yeah, it does appear to be spinning, but I do want to remind everyone that Everything after clearing the tower was icing on the cake. The spaceship reached a peak altitude of nearly 20 miles before its fiery disintegration. Nevertheless, SpaceX officials on the webcast cheered the feat of getting the fully integrated Starship and booster rocket off the ground for the first time with a seemingly otherwise clean launch and declared the brief episode a successful test flight. Getting the Starship and its booster rocket off the ground together for the first time represents a milestone in SpaceX's ambition of sending humans back to the moon and ultimately on to Mars, playing a pivotal role in Artemis, NASA's newly inaugurated human spaceflight program. Elon Musk, the founder and chief executive of SpaceX, congratulated his team on Twitter, which he also owns, saying, quote, Learned a lot for next test launch in a few months. NASA chief Bill Nelson seemed to agree, tweeting, Every great achievement throughout history has demanded some level of calculated risk, because with great risk comes great reward. Looking forward to all that SpaceX learns to the next test flight and beyond. The UN estimates that some 67 million children partially or fully missed routine vaccines between 2019 and 2021. This owing to lockdowns and healthcare disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. UNICEF said that the news meant years of hard-earned gains in routine childhood immunization have been eroded. Vaccine coverage amongst children declined in 112 countries and the percent, uh, percentage of children vaccinated worldwide slipped 5 points to 81%. Africa and South Asia were particularly hard hit. It's the biggest drop in child vaccination in 30 years. UNICEF counts 67 million children whose vaccinations were severely disrupted between 2019 and 2021. Among them, 48 million missed out entirely on routine vaccines. As a result of the strain on healthcare systems during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, childhood immunization declined in 112 countries during this period. Africa has the largest number of unvaccinated or under-vaccinated children, standing at almost 13 million, particularly in Nigeria and Ethiopia. In its report, UNICEF flags concerns about outbreaks of preventable diseases. Last year, the number of children paralysed by polio increased by 16% compared to 2021, while measles cases more than doubled over the same period. After the debates surrounding COVID brought the anti-vax movement to the forefront, the report raised concerns about a drop in public confidence in vaccines, seen in 52 out of 55 countries surveyed. UNICEF called on governments to double down on their commitment to increase financing for immunisation and to accelerate catch-up vaccination efforts for those who missed their shots. Czech Prime Minister Peter Fiala met his Vietnamese counterpart in Hanoi today as part of his three-day official visit to boost ties with the Southeast Asian nation. Vietnamese Prime Minister Phan Nguyen Chin received Fiala outside the presidential palace with a welcoming ceremony before the two leaders held talks and witnessed the signing of bilateral pacts. 
The two nations pledged to strengthen cooperation in various sectors, including education, investment and law enforcement. Fiala was accompanied by a delegation of representatives from 30 Czech companies in the fields of engineering, aviation, weapon and technology. Fiala, on his first trip to Asia, stopped since taking office at the end of 2021, is the first of head of the Czech government to Vietnam in 15 years. Canadian police are investigating the theft of an approximately $14.84 million cargo of gold and other valuables that was stolen from a holding facility at Toronto Pearson International Airport. Police are investigating the theft of a high-value container carrying gold and other valuable items worth an estimate of $20 million Canadian dollars from Toronto's Pearson Airport. Spokesperson for Peel Regional Police said that they did not name the airline and declined to say where the plane arrived from, adding that it could jeopardize the investigation. He also said that the plane was unloaded according to the normal procedure and its cargo taken to the airport holding facility before it was removed by illegal means. The theft was reported shortly after it was discovered. No one had been arrested. The Greater Toronto Airports Authority, which runs the airport, said that the thieves accessed the public side of the warehouse leads to a third party and that the area outside of its primary security line. As for who is behind the theft, the spokesperson said that he would not call it a professional job at this time but added that the investigation is ongoing. The police spokesperson said that there are no disruptions to the airport operations and there are no concerns for travel safety. Police do not yet know where the gold was headed for it is still in the country and no suspect information has been released. Welcome back to World News and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Muslims around the Middle East and North Africa mark the start of Eid al-Fitr with prayers. In Jerusalem, throngs of worshippers join prayers at Al-Aqsa Mosque, Islam's third holiest shrine. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov thanked Cuba for its support in Russia's invasion of Ukraine during a meeting with his counterpart Bruno Rodriguez in Havana to promote cooperation and friendship between the two countries. Climate activists blocked the traffic around Berlin's iconic landmark Brandenburg Gate as they slowly marched through the streets and sat down on the roadways. Chile's President Gabriel Boric said that he would nationalize the country's lithium industry, the world's second largest producer of the metal essential in electric vehicle batteries, to boost its economy and protect its environment. British Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned from the government following an independent investigation into complaints that he bullied colleagues, the latest scandal to force out one of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's top ministers. And that wraps up World News tonight this week. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we had tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with an unusually wet winter that has led the carpets of orange and yellow wildflowers on Southern California's hillside. Stay safe and have a good night.